1,440 warp ends is our goal. 1,440 individual threads that can't tangle or not. It's a lot to keep track of. We've been slowly building up to that number. The spooler brought us up from one end on a cone to 32 ends on a spool. Our next piece of equipment allows us to simultaneously pull the 32 ends off, in our case, 12 spools, at the same time. This little miracle worker is called the creel. Some of you may be quick to notice that 32 ends times 12 spools makes 384 ends, significantly less than our goal. The creel holds enough spools to be able to create a section of warp, in our case, about a quarter of our total warp. Baby steps. The creel does not work alone. Ends are pulled off the spools and threaded through a series of reeds and rollers on a dressing frame, or reed stand, to keep everything even, parallel, and under the right amount of tension. Thomas K. Woolenmill records and photographs show that a variety of machines were used to do this work in the past. An 1890 inventory showed a Cleveland 100-inch six-spool rack warp dresser. A 1906 inventory showed the mill was using one Davis and Ferber and one homemade dresser and beamer. This 1947 photograph shows a much more elaborate setup. The creel we are using today came to the museum in 1996 from the Paris Woolen Mill in Staten, Oregon. The dressing frame, former millwright David Birch remembered, was built to help demonstrate and complete a warping project the museum underwent some years ago. Kind of appropriate given the tradition of homemade equipment that went before it here. Period textbooks suggest there were a lot of equipment available to help with this step of dressing. Some machines were even designed to dip the yarn in a sizing agent, a chemical designed to help keep threads from breaking, before the next steps. We haven't found any evidence yet that that step was employed here at this mill, but it's an interesting fact nonetheless. While the creel and dressing frame had been set up for a small-scale dressing project for a home loom in the recent past, and was left threaded as part of the display, this is the first time these two pieces are being put to action for a commercial-sized project. We needed first to remove the old yarn and spools, but we did this strategically. Placing the ends through the teeny tiny dents of the reed on the frame is fiddly work. In order to theoretically save ourselves some time, we decided to leave the frame threaded and just cut and tie the ends so we could tie on our new ends and pull them through the frame. Well, it was a good idea, but our job requires a lot more ends than the previous one, so I'm not sure how much time it actually ended up saving us in the long run. Threads severed, we removed the old spools and placed the new ones on the racks on the creel. The spool holders are adjustable and staggered on the creel. This helps keep the ends further apart and hopefully less tangled as they're pulled off. The creel also has a series of bars designed to be able to hold drag weights on the top of the spools. These are pretty simple in design, just a notched wooden board with a weight attached to it. The notch sits over the bar to keep it in place, and the weighted end rests directly on the spool itself. The weight keeps the spool from rolling backwards or forwards unintentionally, which I learned by experience can really mess with attention and ability to keep all of your threads untangled. New spools on the creel with weights appropriately placed, we then had to figure out what order to pull the threads off of the spools on the creel. The books we had been reading had decidedly little advice. In the end, we determined to pull the threads off from left to right, doing one from each spool in the same order so that the threads would not cross. Because the spools are staggered, this meant just doing the back row for the first several threads and then alternating between the front and back rows until the end of the back spools, and then just doing the front spools for the last few threads. It definitely helped to make sure to unwind a bit of lead on the yarn by hand rather than rotating the spool. And this was also super helpful to do underneath <laughs> rather than roll it off the spool but just pull it underneath and kind of twist it around to get as much as you needed to get off. The creel has a series of guide bars to help keep tension and order. Wanting to preserve some of the length of the yarn we had run on the spools, it was also very helpful to have a few cones of extra yarn around to help tie up the differences between the yarn on the spool and the leader yarn on the frame. Once we got the end long enough to get to the frame, we tied it to the leader string with a simple knot, pulled it through the dent of the first reed, over the first roller, under the second, and then through the second reed, making sure that nothing got tangled along the way. 
Because our new warp section was bigger than what was done previously, I found I needed to rearrange my leader thread a bit. I also found for me, it was easiest if I could keep the tension while wor I worked on each section. This meant a little bit of blue tape to secure the ends until I got a chunk done. Then I could twist the chunk together and tape it lower again to keep the tension. And that was the routine. For several months. It is tedious work and requires a lot of concentration to make sure, well, I don't know, that we didn't forget to thread over a guide bar or miss a dent in the reed. Not like that ever happened. Okay, it happened a lot. In what seemed like several million knots later, we finally had our first section of warp ready to go. Join us next time as we use the pin reel to bring our warp sections together. Yeah, to unwind it, yeah. <laughs>